It's Kate and Oliver Hudson. Hudson. <laughs> Host of the new podcast, Sibling, Sibling Revelry. Revelry. That's right. We started this show because, you know what? No one talks about siblings and that dynamic. The siblings, they know each other better than anybody. Yes. You know. Listen to Sibling Revelry on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Jacob Goldstein. I used to host Planet Money. Now I'm starting a new show. It's called What's Your Problem? Every week on What's Your Problem, entrepreneurs and engineers describe the future they're going to build. Once they solve a few problems, I'm talking to people trying to figure out how to do things that no one on the planet knows how to do, from creating a drone delivery business to building a car that can truly drive itself. Listen to What's Your Problem on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcast. Episode 281, How to Curate a Life with Less Stuff and More Intention with Christine Platt. Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast, where you'll learn to save money, save money embrace simplicity, embrace it, and live a richer life. life. Here are your hosts, Jen and Jill. <laughs> Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast. My name is Jen. My name is Jill. And today, we are playing an interview we did at our very first Frugal Living Summit. Whoa. Yes. Stuff you haven't even heard unless you were at that summit. Yes, back in 2021. So as I, Jen, prepare to give birth at any minute, any day, any day now, we are going to uh, play a few of the, well, we think they're all the best. We had 20 interviews during that summit, but our most uh, watched, our most anticipated, the ones we got the most feedback on. And uh, really, really excited to share this interview with Christine Platt, also known as the Afro Minimalist. Yes, it was such a good one. And it is a bummer that this wasn't then available on the podcast, but now it is. Now it Forever is. and always, before archived, just on Jen's computer, mm -hmm. now for all the world to see. Yes, but before we bring you this goodness, the episode is brought to you by the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> At the time of recording this, we do not know who will be playing the Super Bowl, but we do know the Bills are doing exceptionally well. Especially after losing Damar Hamlin. <laughs> You're going for it, girl. You're the one who's like doing sports references. <laughs> I cannot help you. Uh, this after my failed golf references. <laughs> um, who, he is still, <laughs> I just want to say, he's still with us. <laughs> they lost him on the field, not in life. <laughs> um, but whether you are one of our beloved listeners in Buffalo or one of our beloved listeners who may be a Buffalo Bill. Mm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or you're just an ad, avid Bill of the Week fan. We want you to have more bills in your life. Mm -hmm. Not the kind that costs you money, but the kind that get you things. So if you can't catch a game, then sign up for a Savings Connect account at CIT because they are currently offering over 4% APY on their savings accounts. That is crazy. There are no hoops to jump through, no lines of scrimmages to jump through. And that was the, that's the, that's the extent of my football knowledge. I don't even think it's accurate. Okay. Well, I didn't I don't think say you it was. through a line of scrimmage. You could. Oh okay. my gosh. It's an imaginary line and you could right. do anything you, could, you want to it. Sure. Yeah. Anyways, no hoops to jump through. Just a hundred dollar minimum deposit. And if you do not have your emergency fund in a high yield savings account, it's time to do it. So head to frugalfriendspodcast.com slash CIT, or maybe you just need a sinking fund for next football season. Maybe you think the Bucks are going to come back with Tom Brady. Mm. And that's what everybody else in this area thinks. Me, I'm putting all my money on the bills. Fugofriendspodcast.com slash CIT. That's I, mainly the takeaway here. I'm and put, also that we know little to nothing about sports, but we try anyway. All the money I make from the interest that I gain in my Savings Connect account, I will be gambling with on the bills. <laughs> <laughs> we got we to 
gotta get to Christine. Okay, never we mind. We have got you gotta give birth. We gotta listen to Christine. Here oh, we wow. go. Okay, so if you are as interested in minimalism, decluttering, simplicity as we are, but not in the minimalism for minimalism's sake conversation. A, you're going to love this episode, but we have a few other episodes that you might like. Um, episode 266, we talk about sustainable minimalism with Stephanie Sferian. She runs the Sustainable Minimalist podcast. Um, and then we also have episode 99 talking about contentment, gratitude, and flexible minimalism within frugality. Those are a couple of my favorite, mm. favorite episodes. So they tie in beautifully with this conversation we have with Christine. Uh, she is the author and advocate known as the Afro Minimalist. She is a children's book author. So if you have kids, she is a fantastic author of children's books. And after struggling in her personal life with the austerity and whiteness of mainstream minimalism, she realized that minimalism often seems unattainable for so many because of this barren aesthetics, you know, minimalism for minimalism's sake sort of view. So she decided to do things her own way by curating a life of less influenced by the African diaspora. And what she discovered is that living with less isn't just liberating, less is liberation. And that's a tagline of hers that I absolutely love. So you will hear so much more of that in this conversation. So let's get into it. Let's do it. Welcome, Christine, to the Future of Frugal Summit. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. Thank you. We are thrilled to have you on this summit and on our podcast. And to be talking about minimalism, it's something that's very near and dear to both Jen and my hearts and lives. So we're super excited to get your take on it. Thanks for joining. Thank you. So, Christine, can you tell us, and for those who might not be familiar with you, although I hope tons are because you've got an amazing platform and some awesome books, uh, but tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to minimalism. Sure, sure. So I am Christine Platt. I like to call myself, I guess, a bit of a Renaissance woman because I do so many different things that I am passionate about. And one of those is an author. I write diverse children's literature. I also um, work in the spaces of social justice and advocacy. And then, yes, I am also a minimalist and I guess more known as the Afro minimalist, <laughs> uh, which is just a little moniker that I made up for myself because my minimalist lifestyle is one that is more influenced by the African diaspora, um, which is really the breadth of my life's work. And so, um, you know, it's a bit more, I guess it's not as traditional as mainstream minimalism. So a lot of bright colors, a lot of mud cloth, a lot of pay playful like patterns and prints. But yeah, that's pretty much like how my minimalist lifestyle is, is influenced. Um, and I've been living with less almost, uh, I'm going into my fifth year now. So it's been, it's been a journey. Mm. Yeah. I'm so inspired by the way that you're describing already that you've made it your own. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and this combination, uh, even just in your introduction, like these are the things that are purposeful and that make me, me. Yes. And also I'm a minimalist and the blending of that and the meaning behind it, not just, I don't like stuff. I'm not sentimental. Therefore, <laughs> okay. Call me a minimalist, but <laughs> no, I've given my life to this topic and different subjects and have found what works for me. Yeah. Can you mm -hmm. speak more to this aspect of how you came to make it your own? Yes. Yes, I'm so glad you said that because this is what I tell folks all the time who are trying to live with less or be minimalist or whatever name they want to frugal, whatever they want to <laughs> call themselves. You know, you really have to do it your own way. And I, I learned that the hard way. I tried to really mirror a lot of the images that I saw 
on Pinterest and on Instagram. And like my house was just like, everything was white, everything was barren. And I was Mm. like, this is so miserable. I hate it here. (laughs) Right. And so I ended up like really just having to make it my, make it my own. And I tell people all the time, that is the only way that I was able to make living with less work for me. And sort of the the tagline that I came up with surrounding that is I tell people all the time, remember authenticity over aesthetics, right? Because mm. we're so caught up in the aesthetics of minimalism, how many things we should have, how our place should look, what colors, right? And it's like, ah, authenticity is where the real you is when it comes to to living with less. And once you focus on authenticity over aesthetics, like it becomes one of, it's just a beautiful practice. Mm, I love that. That's so beautiful. Authenticity. Yeah. I mean, we feel it like with frugality and minimalism because they don't always align. Mm -hmm. Like I describe myself as like a minimalist with a packet drawer. (laughs) So like we, we have like stuff from the thrift store and stuff and it doesn't all match, but it's like, all affordable and then there's not much of it. So it's yeah. like this is great like feeling it's so feels unique and like that yeah. feels good. Yeah, and I mean that's your own authentic style, right? Mm-hmm. And it and it works. And so, you know, I really try and get people to understand that, you know, minimalism, living with less, all of these things, they it, it's really a journey of self-discovery, right? And you're going to discover so many things about yourself. For me, it was yes, of course I knew that, you know, I love the the history and beauty of the African diaspora, right? Like this, these were my majors in college, <laughs> but like, I didn't realize how important it was to me and how much it influenced my home and my space until I went on this journey of self-discovery of like getting rid of all of the things that don't work for me. Right. And so, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I, I feel like it's a lifestyle that is available to everyone. Again, if they focus on authenticity over aesthetics, you focus on aesthetics, you're going to lose out every time because <laughs> all of our lives are different. Right. And yeah. so like to expect that everyone's home is going to fit this sort of Pinterest board is just not realistic, you know? Seriously. I mean, I've got to write this down. It's such a beautiful quote. I think we talk about freedom a lot, how there's there's freedom in frugality and minimalism and simple living, make it work for you. And that is still true. But I think what you're yeah. saying blends well with that. It's two coinciding ideas of yeah. how we get at that freedom that exists for us in all of these spaces. It doesn't have to look just one way we have to make it personal. We've got to make it work for us. And absolutely, what a beautiful kind of banner over our homes and the freedom that we can have it in our homes and in our lives and wherever we kind of interact yeah. and engage this, this concept of authenticity. Thanks for sharing yeah. that with us. And I feel like it's applicable, like you said, to every area of your life, right? Like leading with authenticity, leading with intention, right? Like those are the things that are going to bring you joy. And it just becomes, I feel like once you go through that journey of self-discovery and you start to feel those feelings, like you want to keep feeling it. So it's not, Mm -hmm. it doesn't become like... People are like, does it get harder? I'm like, no, it gets so much easier. Like it gets so so much easier because now you know, Mm -hmm. right? And you want to hold on to those to those feelings. And you know, again, I mean, I also think that it it really helps me remain um, intentional with my minimalist practice and what I allow into my life. Because if I'm, you know, if I'm leading with authenticity, I'm gonna, you know, like I really don't like that. Thank you for that. Thank you for offering me that gift but that doesn't, you know, doesn't serve me. I'm not going to use it. Right. Like you just, Mm -hmm. it just becomes just sort of like this essence of who you are and, and the decisions that you make. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love that the journey taught you about yourself. It's not like just making minimalism about who you are, but actually finding who you are and like finding the real you. I tell people that all the time. I'm like, so I know you think you're going into this, that like you're either trying to, you know, declutter your closet, your garage, or, or, you know, get your home in order. But I'm like, 
it literally transforms every area of your life. There's no way that you can be intentional with your wardrobe or intentional with what you have in your living room and be like, Mm -hmm. okay, that's it. You know, it's like (laughs) you end up being intentional with every area of your life. And I feel like that's where that process of self-discovery is, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe it does start in your closet and you, you know, you're like, what do I really wear? What silhouettes do I really gravitate towards? Why do I have so many of these, right? Like you start this process of self-discovery and then like, it just, it literally like takes over your life. There's no way, I promise you, there's no way you can just be intentional with your wardrobe. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. So I know that you're all about like, letting go and finding what serves you. Mm -hmm. So how do you recommend like people find what serves them and let go of what doesn't? Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's so many different ways. And, but the, the first thing that I really want people to start with that will, that will, I feel help them get to this point is first understanding why they have more than they need and then understanding why it's so hard to let go right because if you don't if you don't understand why you have more than you need you're going to end up in the same space right and so there are you know several different reasons for that um you know maybe it's unfulfilled childhood expectations right like maybe maybe it's something that started in childhood maybe you grew up with scarcity you know maybe you grew up with abundance and it was just too much and now you don't like like you can't have a lot of stuff around you right you know, for some people, it's it's uh, cultural and societal expectations. It could be mindless consumption. It could be conspicuous consumption. It could be all these different things, but you have to know why you have more than you need. And then understanding why it's so hard to let go, right, which is really rooted in the psychology of ownership, which I had to learn all about working on my book. It was like, I... I it was it was mind boggling. Like I just couldn't believe it. And and believe it or not, like I didn't get this information from psychology journals. It was all marketing materials. Like millions of dollars yeah. are spent on, you know, understanding the psychology of how consumers buy and spend. And it was just mind boggling to me. So that's the other thing is like, why is it so hard to let go? And the psychology of ownership are attachments to things. Why have we formed attachments to things, right? So then once you have that information, then you can go into, okay, I know where my pitfalls are, right? For me, I was a bargain shopper. And I talk about this all the time. I love finding a deal. Mm. And, you know, that whole, why do I have more than I need piece for me was going through my closet and realizing that like so many things had red stickers on them. And I was like, what is this? (laughs) Why am I attracted to all these red stickers? (laughs) <laughs> Everything has a red sticker. It is unworn huh. as a red mm-hmm. sticker. And I had to like really dig down and say like, where's this coming from? And it went back to my childhood. Me and my mom used to go shopping together on the weekends. And, um, you know, shopping for me became synonymous with relaxation, with fun, with joy, right? And so that is something that I took with me into adulthood. And my mom was a bargain shopper, still is. <laughs> And so for me, though, it was, I discovered it was the thrill of the hunt for me. So once I hunted and I found what I needed (laughs) and I got it home, it went in the closet, right? But that led me to understand, here's why you have so much more than you need in your closet, right? And then I had to go, okay, well, why is it so hard for me to let some of this stuff go? For me, it was this feeling of guilt, right? Like, oh my God, I bet even though, I mean, I spent my hard earned money on it, even though it was a deal, I still spent my money on it or, you know, oh, this is so beautiful. Look at this designer label, right? Like I had to understand what my attachments to things were. And it was rooted in their either actual value or perceived value, which Mm -hmm. is another issue (laughs) where so many of us struggle. Yeah. You know, and then I think like, so to answer your question, I feel like once you go through that process of self-discovery, it really helps you with the process of letting go and more importantly, not bringing more back in. So now when I go to stores, because whatever your feelings are, 
Like, it's not that they magically go away. I still feel a little tingle when I see like a little clearance rack. I'm like, (laughs) my heart starts fluttering. I'm like, oh oh my God, something's on sale, right? And so like, I I had to come up with something to help me through that. And and so what I say when I go into stores, especially like my favorite store, like I love anthropology and, you know, candles, all those things, right? Mm -hmm. And I just tell myself, I'll see a clearance rack. I'm like, Christine it's not a deal if you don't need it. Like I have to like, this is the mantra that I tell my, you're not saving money if you're spending it. (laughs) You know, like you're not saving $20, you're losing $50. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like, but I had to tell like, there's like, I create mantras and different things, but you can't do that really until you know what Mm -hmm. your reasons are behind your overconsumption. Right. So My background is in social work and the mental health field and also my day job, let's be real. So it doesn't really surprise me. Well, it doesn't surprise me at all, but how we can't get away from all of these things being connected. We are whole people. Mm -hmm. And as much as we might want to kind of separate or fracture one part from the other of, this is just my finances. I'm just going to work on my finances or this is just me decorating my home. It has nothing to do with my childhood. (laughs) Right. No, we're whole people. And the more that we can All pay attention to that, be curious with ourselves, just practice mm-hmm. curiosity and then discover what works for you, what doesn't work for you. But I appreciate the permission and encouragement that you're providing of ask these questions first yeah. before we just say, well, just stop shopping or just do yeah. a no spend. Those things are great, mm-hmm. but what is it teaching us about ourselves? Yeah. And I mean, you know, there are so many practitioners in this field that I respect and admire. You know, I mean, I've conmarried my closet. I don't even know how many times I do it like every season um, for mm-hmm. Project 333 to create my capsule, right? Mm-hmm. But like I tell people all the time, it's so much more than just walking into your closet and saying like, okay, does this spark joy, right? Like something mm-hmm. is always gonna like, you got it because it sparked joy or because you thought it was beautiful or something like that, right? Like you have to really dig down deep and and say like, why am I buying more of what I don't need? Why am I buying more of what I don't need? AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing. And of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash strategic. That's oracle.com slash strategic. oracle.com slash strategic. Discover the heartwarming and hilarious world of sibling connections on Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson. You might be asking yourself, what is sibling revelry? Yeah, well, we just made it up. They'll have some laughs and maybe inspire some people along the way with universal tales of what it's like to grow up with brothers and sisters. We're full blood siblings, the only full blood sibling. In our family. Well, not in the world. I mean, no, in the whole world. This is it. Like, no one. (laughs) Dive into family tales and explore the human mind with guests like Joel and Benji Madden. And it's fun because we've decided to open it up, you know, to really like all kinds of different siblings. And it's going to be an awesome season. It's more than a podcast. It's a celebration of the ties that bind us. Listen to Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Speaking of purchasing, so much of this is connected. As we talk about simple living and paring down and identifying what's our authentic selves, what have you found are the financial realities of this, of aiming at minimalism or or more living authentically? What have you seen there? 
I mean, the amount that I've been able to save is like, (laughs) I mean, I think that the other thing, right? Like you realize, which is so hard when, I mean, that's, it's why so many people struggle through that letting go process. It's really not that they want to keep the things. It's that it's their money, right? And they're looking at the piles and they're literally seeing dollar signs, right? And, you know, there's a whole process of like, you just got to pay it forward. You're never going to be able to recoup everything that you spent. Like you just got to let it go. But um, for me, (laughs) like, realizing how much money I was spending on the weekends, going out and bargain shopping, things that I did, like once I stopped, like you just, you're like, wait, where did I, did I get like a raise or something? And you're like, where did all this money, it adds up so fast. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the other thing that I tell people, like one of the first changes that you'll see is in your finances. Right. And, um, for me, it was, it was, it, it was a, it was a huge motivator, mm. right? Because um, I was always paycheck to paycheck. And I remember like how quickly I stopped being paycheck to paycheck and just was like, wow, I was really, I was really spending just <laughs> recklessly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And again, thinking I was getting a deal, as you said, right? <laughs> yeah. Especially if you think you're saving money. Yeah. Can I ask mm-hmm. what you found to replace that with? Like the thrill of the hunt or something to relax yourself or enjoying shopping? What did you find? You know, I actually love being in my home. Mm. (laughs) Now that sounds so crazy, (laughs) but once especially after twenty twenty, but good for you. (laughs) But like, no, like once I once I found, um, you know, my my authentic style and you know curated my space with just like love and intention. Like I just love being in that space. Mm. If I'm not at home, I love going for walks. I love visiting friends. Right. But I just, yeah, like, I mean, I would, so many weekends are spent at home instead of in the mall, like even during the pandemic, right. (laughs) Because home is now, it's a sanctuary for me. It's a place where I rest, where I recharge, where I, I mean, it's, it's magical for me. Right. Yeah. I love that. And it's so funny. Like we buy in order to complete, like either to complete our wardrobe or to complete Mm -hmm. the aesthetics of our home. We buy to complete, but when you stop buying and you say, I am, this is complete. Like I am complete without this stuff. Like then it becomes a sanctuary. It does. It does. And I mean, like, ah, just the, the lightness And that comes with that, right? And the Mm -hmm. lightness that comes with, you know, not feeling like you have to hang something on every wall or have something in every corner, right? I mean, this is, um, I have an office space here in DC at um, Eaton DC. They have a wonderful space for creators. And I mean, I promise you before my minimalist journey, like every wall would have been covered, everything, like it just sort of, (laughs) right? So even like, learning use of space, right? Mm. Learning how to, to, to utilize that in a way that is more functional for you rather than in in something that it, it has to be filled, right? Like there's all these lessons that, that you learn. And so, I mean, I, I just, I enjoy my life so much and it's something that I want so many more people to experience because it's, it's not, that hard of a heavy lift. It's just making mm-hmm. that initial jump and decision to say, you know what, I'm going to live more more frugal. I'm going to live with less. I'm going to be intentional. I'm going to, you know, lead with authenticity, which these are all things that we should be doing anyway, even if not for ourselves, for the good of our planet, for our communities, right? Like there's so many benefits to it. And so I love showing a different approach to minimalism. Um, and I'll get questions and comments all the time. You know, people will say, oh my gosh, I can be a minimalist now. You have color in your house, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. oh, you know, that, that so pillow is crazy. red, right? And it's so funny but because people, again, wow. are so caught up in the aesthetics. Mm-hmm. Because right? Patrice has only showed one thing. It's a green fiddly fig against a white wall that, and a and bamboo that white desk. Swedish chair. Yes. Yeah. That one chair that everyone has. Yes. Yeah. 
And so like, I love showing people that and just, you know, again, as you said, just like giving them the liberty and permission to just like, let me just try it, but let me try it my way, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I feel that the office decorating thing on a deep level, like behind me, I have my bookshelf and it, the bottom, you can't see it really, but like the bottom (laughs) shelf doesn't really have any books on it. And I'm like, I feel like I, a bookshelf should have books <laughs> all the way down, but like, I'm not going to get more books yeah. <laughs> just, but to, this make, is just what, to fill it. I'm just going to like kind of shift my body. Yeah. But so you know you what, only Jen, top two. <laughs> Jen, this is what we do like with our, with our furniture, with our living spaces, right? Like, mm-hmm. and I think so many people saw this during the pandemic, right? Like they, until you were forced to be at home, you didn't realize either how much home you weren't utilizing or how underutilized your space was. And so, you know, I also tell people, you know, frugality and minimalism is also about reimagining the space and things that you already have, right? So Mm -hmm. you need a homeschool space for your kids. Uh, uh, That dining room set in there that no one uses, right? Dining that, rooms are so overrated. Yeah, they oh don't God. get used. <laughs> but people feel so compelled to use it as a dining room because mm-hmm. the builder says, this is your dining room. This is your living room. This is your bedroom, right? And like getting people to understand, reimagine and make the space work for you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like your dining room may be better served as an office, right? Right. Yes. Freedom. You don't, yeah. And you don't have to fill every space. And I love that you use that bookshelf as an example. That would never be the case for me. All my bookshelves are like, we're about to fall over. Yeah. <laughs> but I um, have that at one point. But, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. just like that pressure that we feel, I feel like mm-hmm. that's a, a really good example. Like I have to, it's a bookshelf. It should be filled with books. It's okay. Yeah. The books will come. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, I had a baby and I had to like move the bookshelf out of my office so Uh that I could put my son in there. So that was like what forced me to pare down my books. (laughs) So have a child. It'll force you to pare down your stuff so you can fill your house with their their stuff. (laughs) So Christine, tell us a little bit about the cultural expectations people might encounter when trying to adopt minimalism. Because I know that's something like you worked through. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, every culture and group has their own thing. And, um, you know, a a lot of it are, um, I would even say not even cultural expectations. It's more societal expectations, right? Which is like, what do you mean you're, you don't like shopping? You're a woman. Don't all women like shopping? Or, you know what I mean? Or like, Mm -hmm. you're a man. Why don't you have 10 pairs of Jordans? Like what, you know what I mean? Like, so you, you, what you will face is sort of like questions and challenges and critiques and commentary from friends and family. That's what I feel like that expect, that expectation is. Also, some people may realize that they are in certain situations that they're in, because of societal or cultural expectations, right? So one of the Mm -hmm. examples that I like to use is um, I was doing a workshop on minimalism and this is about two years ago. So like I was still in the midst of my journey and still like trying to help and bring anyone along who would listen. (laughs) (laughs) And um, this young dentist came up to me and she waited until like the room was cleared And she said, you know, everything that you said today just like really resonated with me. And she said, you know, I have this huge townhouse, so much more. It's just me, right? And she said, I would love, there's an apartment that's right near my job that I could just walk to. And she was like, but my family would be like, they would just frown upon it because like you're a dentist, you know, or you're a doctor, you're a Mm -hmm. lawyer, aren't you supposed to have, aren't you supposed to own, aren't you, you know, and like getting her to understand that like, this is her life. (laughs) And anytime you feed into those expectations, you find yourself in spaces and places and with things that aren't really, again, authentic representations of who you are, right? And so I feel like so many people will, as they go through that journey of self-discovery, realize like, oh, this is why I have this house, or this is why I have this car, 
or this is why, you know, for me, I had like, even though they were on clearance, it was like all these designer shoes and, you know, suits and all these different things because I wanted to look the part of being Mm -hmm. an attorney, right? And I felt like I had to look the part. Mm -hmm. Guess what? My clients didn't care, right? Like, (laughs) yeah, I I rarely saw them, (laughs) right? (laughs) You know, but, but these are the kind of things that, you know, so when I talk about pressures and expectations, you know, some of them do come from family members and friends and cultures and our community, but so much of it is also societal, right? And like breaking, for me, like breaking those chains was so important, like getting my daughter to understand, like, we don't have to go to the mall every weekend. Just don't have to go to the mall every weekend. Discover the heartwarming and hilarious world of sibling connections on Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson. You might be asking yourself, what is sibling revelry? Yeah, well, we just made it up. They'll have some laughs and maybe inspire some people along the way with universal tales of what it's like to grow up with brothers and sisters. We're full blood siblings, the only full blood siblings. In our family. Well, not in the world. I mean, no, in the whole world. (laughs) That's just it. Like, no one. Dive into family tales and explore the human mind with guests like Joel and Benji Madden. And it's fun because we've decided to open it up, you know, to really like all kinds of different siblings and it's going to be an awesome season. It's more than a podcast. It's a celebration of the ties that bind us. Listen to Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. From the studio who brought you the number one podcast, The Piketon Massacre, this is Murder 101. A group of high school students started a project to research a string of unsolved murders. Those murders happened in the mid-1980s. He's out there doing stuff. He just didn't stop. Everything that the students predicted through their profile turned out to be accurate. Redhead killer profile. Male. Caucasian. 5'9 to 6'2. 180 to 270 pounds. Unstable home. Absent father and a domineering mother. Right-handed. IQ above 100. Most likely heterosexual. There is no profile of this killer except for the ones the students created. Just because some of these women no longer have people to speak for them does not mean that they deserve to not be spoken for. What if this guy's still alive? Like, what if he comes after us? I said, are you going to kill me? He said, yes. Listen to Murder 101 on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. As I hear you talk, Christine, it's so apparent how much this is linked to our confidence in our own self, who we are, the decisions that we're making, the autonomy that we have, the personal ownership that we can take on, the freedom that exists there. But yeah, there, there's a journey to that. To yeah. not, not that we don't care, oh, you don't matter, but to not place that much weight on what other people think or say or yeah. the societal mm-hmm. pressures of here's your job, this is what you should do. And I see it going both directions of you're wealthy, you should, or you say you're a minimalist, but how do you have so many tools in your garage? Or <laughs> how do you have so many kitchen appliances? Or yeah, whatever that thought yeah. is, it can go either way where people will just beat you up at yeah. other end of the spectrum. That's, mm-hmm. that's, that's exactly why you have to focus on being your authentic self. And I love that you mentioned that minimalist piece because minimalism has become this whole conspicuous thing, which is like so annoying to me (laughs) because again, it feeds into this aesthetic thing. Right. And so Mm -hmm. another reason why I love showing my aspects of minimalism is it's like a real house and it's a real authentic reflection of my life. And I remember someone I had, oh my, it was like a feature that I'd done. I think it was apartment therapy And um, it was like my first big feature and I was so excited. And I mean, people were like, (laughs) there was, I shouldn't say people. There was one commenter who said, you know, I just don't see how you can call yourself a minimalist and you have all those pillows on your bed. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I use like Euro pillows and then I have like bed pillows and I also have like a body pillow. But what that is for me, (laughs) I am in my bed writing all the time. I am an author. I write in bed. What do I look like having one pillow 
not being able to support my back and do what I need Mm -hmm. to do because I'm worried about someone looking at an image on Instagram and questioning whether or not I'm a minimalist because I have four pillows instead of two pillows, right? Like it becomes like this thing. And this is why, again, you just have to lead with authenticity. And I posted about that. um, I posted about that whole commentary a while ago. And it was, the comments were so funny. Because I was like, what do I look like walking around here with a hurt back? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Someone is worried about how many pillows I have, right? And like someone who I'm probably never going to meet in real life, probably didn't even use their real name. I don't even remember who they are. Like, why would you structure and build your life around someone else's expectations of you? It is just beyond me. And someone else's narrow definition of what minimalism means. Super narrow. frugality means. And how can you keep up? How can you keep up? Yes. Yeah. Someone is, yeah. Yeah. Someone else can changing. say this. Yeah. yeah if it's, like if it's only two pillows, changing. it's going to be the color of the pillows. If it's not the color of the yeah. pillows, it's going to be the size of the bed. Who? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. I don't got time for that. No. <laughs> I need my pillows. I need like three pillows behind my back. One Listen. pillow, sometimes two pillows on top of me. Depending the on know. where I'm at. <laughs> right? The mom is I am. And I need tons of tools in my garage so my husband can build me stuff and fix me stuff. So. And I like my packet drawer. <laughs> and I like my packet We all got it. <laughs> you know? And so again, just like living your authentic life, being your authentic <sighs> self and like structuring it in a way that works for you, yeah. right? Like, yes, I may have four pillows, right? Where someone else may have 50 t-shirts. I may have two because I don't wear a lot of t-shirts, but if you need, use and love your 50 t-shirts, have at it. It's your life, right? I think you're already getting at it, Christine, but (laughs) if you could put more thoughts to this, what would you hope the future of minimalism includes? Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely want minimalism to include more diverse voices and perspectives. And I don't just mean racially, right? I mean, I think there are so many different ways that minimalists live and just showing people the many, I mean, I have friends that live on converted school buses, right? There are van life folks. There are, you know, people, they come over my house and it feels like a mansion because they live in 300 and square feet, right? And I live in 600. They're like, oh, there's so much room over here, right? Um, you know, one of my dear friends, um, Radia Road, she lives in Baltimore. They have a beautiful home. And, you know, upon first blush, someone would walk up and say like, there's no way a minimalist lives here, right? But they only have in there what their family need, uses, and loves, right? So showing people also like, no one is saying that you have to downsize your house. Like people think like it's this huge life transformation that has to happen, right? It's like, if your house works for you, keep your house and work on the things that are in your house, right? Mm -hmm. If your house doesn't work for you, right? (laughs) Finding a space that does work better Mm -hmm. for your family, right? Um, And so when I talk about like showing just diversity and minimalism, it's showing the many different ways that people live with less because I feel like it's such a source of inspiration for other people who are still trying to figure out their journey rather than showing the same fig leaf fiddle against the wall. Yes. (laughs) Oh, it's so beautiful, Christine. It's reminding me, (laughs) you might have your own opinions on this book. I'm going out on a limb. It is a children's book. I don't know if you're familiar with it and I'm going to forget who the author is, but it, the whole premise is like, come over, there's this common refrain, come over to my house, come over and play. And it's going throughout like different nations describing how people uh-huh. live, clearly not stating one being better than another, just the children yeah. in that home saying, come over to my house, come over and play. Here's where I sleep. Here's where I eat. It's just uh-huh. like so beautiful. And I feel like you're capturing that in your hopes for the future of come over to my house. Here's what minimalism looks like for yes. me. Come over to my house. This is what it looks I like for me. I love that. Yeah. I love yes. that. 
I might use that for like the name of a TV show. So yes. just like, call like, come over to my house. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't yes. pigeonhole us. And it's interesting. I think yeah. when, when we choose one thing, people think, okay, well, now you're going to stick with it. I used to live in yeah. 170 square foot tiny home. Now I don't. Mm. Now I live in 1400 mm-hmm. square feet because this is what yeah. works for me now. And and I felt yeah. that freedom. And I think it's, it's a message. I'm with you. I want to help to tell people, you know, this is what worked for us then. We love it. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean that it didn't work out. It was perfect for that time. And now here's what we're doing. And you don't have to ever feel stuck. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I I like to say that we're always growing and evolving, right? And so our lifestyle is going to grow and evolve and change, right? So like right now, 600 square feet works for me. You know, I don't know. Like I have dreams of a tiny house, you know, we'll see how that works, you know? I also love the idea of van life. Like mm-hmm. there's so many different ways, again, mm-hmm. to live with less. And I think, you know, I really love that idea, as you said, like come over to my house and just like, let's show the many different ways that frugality looks, that minimalism looks, like all of these like buzzwords. Yeah. Let's show like, these are our lifestyles. Like let's show how people live in these spaces. So mm, beautiful. I hope that's my hope. That's, well, that's Christine, hope. if you ever do van life, we've got RV parking in our in our backyard. So Woo-hoo. come over to my house. Come over for dinner. <laughs> yes. I will. I love it. This has been such a beautiful conversation. I, it's I hope inspiring to everybody who's listening and watching. I've loved it. Same. To lighten it up a little bit. Uh Uh, Let's end with asking you, Christine, what is your bill of the week? (laughs) My bill of the week. Hmm. I think my bill of the week this week. So, um, oh, there's so many. Actually, I know what my bill of the week is. (laughs) It's my daughter's tuition to Penn State. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) so super excited. She, she, um, she got accepted to Penn State and um, finally declared, you know, such a wild and weird year. (laughs) And so, yeah, she, she will be starting um, shortly after this conference ends. (laughs) And so that's my bill of the week. Well done. (laughs) How amazing to have zeroed in on a college and kind of what she wants to do next. I'm sure bittersweet for you. Very bittersweet. And um, so much so that I've already planned what I'm doing with her room. So yeah. So (laughs) so (laughs) Well, you've done your job. You raised a child who got into college. I'm actually done. I'm like, you did it. Yeah. I'm like... (laughs) Indoor botanical garden. Here we come. Oh, that's <laughs> yes. stunning. I feel like that's the real bill. It's like I've paid a bill in order to have my indoor botanical garden. Yes. <laughs> that's it. It's nothing to do with education. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Well, thank you so much, Christine, for coming and chatting with us. This is great. Um, yeah. Uh, where can people find more from you and get your book? Sure. Sure, sure. So you can find me on Instagram under Afro Minimalist. Um, you can find me online at afrominimalist.com. Everything is Afro Minimalist, it's super minimalist and simple. Um, and then also you can check out my new book, which I probably should have had closer. <laughs> <laughs> Made that mistake before. Yeah. The Afro Minimalist Guide to Living with Less. Mm. Um, and in there, you know, I talk about a lot of the themes that we talked about today, just more in depth. And um, yeah, hopefully you guys will have me back on and we can meet up again here as well. Oh, yeah. I would love that, and Christine. I can see that book cover standing out mm-hmm. so vividly with all of the other minimalist <laughs> all books of the other, on the shelves. <laughs> all of the, the other one, all. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yours will stand out. So if you go and get one, a physical copy, you will not be able to miss it. Yeah, and we will have links um, below this video to all of that too. So thank, thank you, you so much, Christine. Congrats on the book, Christine, and thank you. No, this was great. Thank you both so much for having me. Oh, what a great conversation with Christine. I feel like so much wisdom Mm -hmm. (laughs) two years ago and today. I remember really enjoying that and 
and enjoyed it again and hope you all also enjoyed it Mm -hmm. and were able to take away just a few nuggets or maybe the whole thing. Maybe it's the whole meal. It's not just a little chicken snack. It's (laughs) everything. And it's totally going to revamp some of your behaviors and decisions, whatever, whatever you choose to do. We just hope that this was a fruitful dialogue for you. Yeah, I really still to this day appreciate the authenticity over aesthetic Mm -hmm. piece because so much of minimalism has been distilled down into an aesthetic, a very like particular aesthetic. And I just love the freedom to just live simple and not with no stuff. Because if you follow Christine, she's I am Christine Platt on Instagram you can see her apartment is not empty. Her apartment has stuff. She got throw pillows, you know, (laughs) and I love it. And it's, but it's only stuff that she loves Mm -hmm. and that really speaks to her and her background and her identity. And that's authenticity. And I love, love, love that. We're here for that. Oh, yeah. We're also here for you. Thank you again for listening to this podcast, this episode. Many of you know last month we did a spending makeover and it was a hit. Oh, really, it was so we fun. all loved it. Yeah. It was so fun. And we want to congratulate and share some of our participants in that spending makeover, some of the big mindset shifts and changes they made. Lindsay shared, honestly, it's realizing that I stick with patterns and impulse purchases whenever I'm feeling down to lift my spirits. Now I'm going to work on creating healthier habits and solutions for when I start to feel that way. Well done, Lindsay. Mm-hmm. Then Michelle shared, you can buy anything, but you can't buy everything. Life-changing mindset shift for impulse buyers. Yay, Michelle. So true. And Jennifer said, knowing that each person is a set is at a different point in their journey and that I can find those people with a similar situation in the online group. Amazing. These are just like a smattering of yes. what some of the feedback was, some of the takeaways were from that spending makeover. So great. Yeah. Congrats to everyone who participated in the spending makeover. And uh, we loved it so much that uh, we decided to make it available to everyone. Yeah. if Even if you missed it last month, NBD, no big deal. We've just made the makeover videos and workbook available for anyone at any time. If you want to check it out and make some of your own revelations, head to frugalfriendspodcast.com slash makeover. You can check it out. You can engage with it for free. Yes. Yeah, so we will, uh, we'll see you there. She ya. Frugal Friends is produced by Eric Siriani. So, Jill, will you be having a Super Bowl party again this year? Ooh, it depends on who's playing. Oh, my goodness. What if the Bills play? That'd be amazing. We know the Bucks are out. Yeah. So it's free range to be a Bills fan now. Yeah. I mean, probably. I guess I am here for like the Buffalo chicken dip. So it really doesn't actually matter who plays. Yeah. If people want to come over and eat chicken wings, that's great. But no children. <laughs> <laughs> no children this year. Made that mistake my, last year's party. My house is still in renovation mode. No kids <laughs> your allowed. For everything. Yeah. I just have to make sure that there's like a few <laughs> exposed wires and sharp tools in my house, like for the un- unforeseen future. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, unforeseen amount of time. And then I've just got a great excuse. Yeah. Adults only. My house won't get ruined. I'm sad that I won't be able to participate in a drinking game this year because mm-hmm. I really believe drinking games are my spiritual gift. <laughs> I don't know which Enneagram is best at making drinking games, but that's my Enneagram. I love, hold on, just for like any listeners who continue to tune in to this part of the show, you say drinking game and it is that, Mm -hmm. but we never engage in it 
as a true drinking game. Like it's not a like quick get drunk kind of no. a thing. It's like a we're usually sipping water by the end of it. It's just like speak for yourself. The amount of times the announcer says I don't know. It's like when the announcer says when Tom or, Brady is mentioned because yeah. even when he's not there they're going to talk about him. <laughs> So, like, you just take a sip whenever somebody mentions Tom Brady or Giselle Bunchen, or, yeah. like, you take but two sips when the fireworks go off or it's planes It's not as if you're over. drinking more than your, like, one to two drinks and then you move no. to water. It's That's just how fun. we play drinking games. It's just fun to, like, when somebody sees one and they're like... They just said, wait, they just said Tom Brady <laughs> yes, And And that's is the fun. fun part. It's a um, fun way to engage in something that you wouldn't maybe otherwise. Yeah, I would say know, if you haven't in. tried doing it, try it. We love to gamify things. We do. We absolutely <laughs> do. And that's um, my that's my gifting is yeah. drinking games. So you'll we'll just have like some iced tea or lemonade for you. Thank you. That's oh, Okay, I guess. Happy Zebra Ball. Discover the heartwarming and hilarious world of sibling connections on Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson. Dive into family tales, explore the human mind, and laugh with guests like Joel and Benji Madden. It's more than a podcast. It's a celebration of the ties that bind us. And it's fun because we've decided to open it up to really like all kinds of different siblings. And it's going to be... A, an awesome season. Listen to Sibling Revelry with Kate Hudson and Oliver Hudson on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jacob Goldstein. I used to host Planet Money. Now I'm starting a new show. It's called What's Your Problem? Every week on What's Your Problem, entrepreneurs and engineers describe the future they're going to build once they solve a few problems. I'm talking to people trying to figure out how to do things that no one on the planet knows how to do from creating a drone delivery business to building a car that can truly drive itself. Listen to What's Your Problem on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts.